it all. That was amazing. So either um, our co-chair, Shayma or uh, Ellen would like to call the meeting order. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Uh, we would like to go ahead and call this meeting to order. It is 10.09. Um, I think we're going to get started with the roll call and introductions. Patrice, would you mind doing roll call for us? Matt Malone? Here. Beto Garibay? Present. Lisa Eamon Crow? Present. Ellen McDonald? Present. Uh, Simon O'Connell for Dinah Beckham? Present. Shannon Ortland for Lynn Mackey? Present. Lashante Smith? Gilbert Salinas? Present. Melvin Willis? Here. Shayla Bonner? Present. Michael Pearson? Present. Rennell Ellis. No, he's running a little late, so I'm sure he'll be here shortly. Alicia Jackson. Present. Carol Sadu. Um, Sudden. Sudden. Excuse me. Sorry, Cheryl. It's okay. Present. Gigi Crowder. Present. And Stephanie Metzing. Here. All right. Good morning and conference. And then next, we want to go ahead and do a round of introductions. Um, we can start in the room and then move to Zoom. Shannon Orton, I'm the coordinator of assessment research and evaluation from the Department of Education. He's even has a uh, Melvin Lewis, Racial Justice Coalition. Uh, Beto Garvin, the chair of the Dutch Cass County Sheriff's Office, facility commander at the Dutch County Detention Facility. Good morning, I'm the Tom Hobbling Commander. Stephanie Medley Rise. Uh, Matt Below, Chief Counsel, Congress Superior Court. DG Crowder, Connecticut Director of Nominee. Simon O'Connell, DA's Office. Alana Matthews, DA's Office. Michael Pearson with Key Council PC. Alicia Jackson, Reentry Manager, Hope Solutions. Uh, Denise Sabkevich, Office of Reentry and Justice. Uh, Trithy Mulcutla, DA's office. Patrice uh, Gillery. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Kiki. Good morning, Kiki Perry, Dispatch Cross County Probation. Patrice Gillery from Office of Reentry and Justice. Gariana Youngblood, Office of Reentry and Justice. Thank you. And then we'll go to Zoom. I see Rob. Hey, y'all. I'm Rob Kenta from the Center for Police and Equity. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Juanisha? Hi, everyone. Juanisha Bird with Center for Police and Equity. Liz? Hello. Liz Swavola, also with the Center for Policing Equity. Chris? Good morning, everyone. Chris James with the W. Haywood Burns Institute. Cheryl. In in the spirit of the room, Cheryl, 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 Cheryl said it, said it, said it, said it. Said it. <laughs> racial, <Yeah>. racial justice. <laughs> racial justice coalition. <laughs> part of the, yeah. the oversight body. There is feedback in the room, just FYI. <laughs> Doug. That was great, Cheryl. Uh, I'm Doug Leach, Multi-Faith Action Coalition. OG. OG Strogast, Serge Contra Costa. Jennifer. Good morning. Jen Qualic, Office of Supervisor Candace Anderson. And Stephanie. Uh, uh, Stephanie Taddeo. Um, I'm a member of the Racial Justice Coalition and I'm also a member of NAMI. Thank you. Stephen. Good morning. Stephen Griswold here, um, Office of Supervisor Burgess. Crawford. Crawford Carpenter. Crawford Carpenter, CAB member. Thank you, Crawford. Jill? Hi there, it's Jose, Office of Supervisor Candidate. 
Christina, did you already introduce yourself? Not yet. This is Christina okay. Jackson, also with the Office of Reentry and Justice. Good morning. Thank you. And I know Denise introduced herself. Um, I see two iPhones. Um, would you like to come off mute and introduce yourself? Yeah, what's up, y'all? My name is Jose Cordon. My name is Impact. Thank you. And the other iPhone? Okay. Right. Thank you all for, for joining us this morning uh, for this special meeting. Um, I would like to open it up for any announcements at this time. Hearing and seeing no announcements, we'll move to public comment. Um, any items under this jurisdiction? <clears throat> sorry, sorry, I'm losing my voice. Any item under this jurisdiction of the our job and not on this agenda? We want to open it up for public comment. <clears throat> Quiet group today. I think we just want to just jump right into business. All right. <laughs> um. Let's see, next we wanna move it to um, our presentation from Center for Policing Equity. We'll turn it over to Juanisha. Thanks, Shayla. Hey everyone, I'm gonna share my screen. Just give me one moment. Um, the host has it disabled, um, the screen sharing feature. It's now able, enabled. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. And could I get a thumbs up if you guys can see the presentation? Anisha, we can see it, but I do see Cheryl has her hand up. Yes. Cheryl. Cheryl? Sorry, um, uh, uh, Shayla, I didn't get my hand quick enough before we start this. I, I did have a question uh, about the agenda that I wanted to, to ask because, um, so may I, Chair? Yes. <laughs> um, it's about the Truth Act Forum. In the past, we've had an opportunity to speak at the Truth Act Forum, and last year we did not. So I wanted to, to just add that on here somewhere. In conjunction with CIRA, I just wanted to, to, to have a brief discussion on it somewhere on the agenda. Ellen, if it's okay, do you think we could um, discuss that when we get to discussion and review of Sheriff's, Sheriff's um, Office quarterly report? Would that be a good place to, to discuss? Or Patrice, do you think that's a good place to discuss? I do you think it's a good place to discuss, which is under net steps and action items, item four. Okay. And the next, um, my understanding is the next Sheriff's Office quarterly report will occur in conjunction with the Truth Act Forum. So I think what you flagged, Cheryl, is perfectly with that last bullet of item four. Okay, thank you. Okay, cool. Any other, I'm sorry, any other comments before? I know I was kind of moving fast. Anybody else raise hand? Okay. I will shut. Sheila, if I, I can do a quick introduction if you want to see this before they start yes, yes. to give a Please. little context. Um, I know that the last time we met, there was a lot of uh, community discussion and dialogue around um, the, the tax disclosures and the corruption with the Antioch Police Department. And so one of the um, gaps in information that various committee members discussed was looking at um, best practices and how to bring equity at the policing phase of folks' um, contact with the criminal legal system. So um, the Public Defender's Office has been working with um, the Center for Policing Equity, which who were, were um, gracious enough to join us this morning. And um, these are researchers and community members, data scientists that work together to empower vulnerable communities, particularly Black communities, and to partner with leaders all over the country to redesign public safety systems and um, facilitate innovative, lasting change and look at best practices. So, so these are the leaders in the field for policing equity and for seeing what works and what doesn't work 
all over the country and they have years and years and years of experience. So I'm really grateful they were able to take time to meet us um, with us this morning and to give technical assistance to this group because some of what we heard in the last meeting was folks looking for change and looking for solutions, but um, both kind of uh, thinking about what role this group can play and then thinking about overall the community and what the community would like to see in terms of change um, with the situation that we have in Contra Costa. So that's why CPE is here this morning. Sadly, they have a hard stop at 11, but um, I know they have some great slides, so I'll I'll punch it um, back over and just thank them very much for uh, working with us on this. Thanks so much, Ellen. I'm gonna reshare my screen and then we could jump right in. Just give me one moment. Okay, um, can I get a thumbs up if it's now visible again? Thank you. So um, I do want to start off again. My name is Juanisha with the Center for Policing Equity. Um, I do want to say just thank you to the Racial Justice Oversight Body and community for inviting CPE into this space today. And you know, we want to, we want to acknowledge the pain and trauma that your community has been experiencing due to harmful and unjust policing. I'm gonna. Go to the next slide. So um, our presentation today um, will include an introduction of Center for, for Policing Equity and also the triage response team. We'll also um, discuss police reform efforts um, and we also discuss strategies for public safety redesign and examples of city and county partnership efforts. Then we'll close and have opportunities for questions at the end of the presentation today. The Center for Policing Equity, um, we produce analysis identifying the cause of racial disparities in law enforcement. We advocate for large scale and meaningful change, and we also use evidence-based approaches to social justice. We use data to create levers for social and cultural and policy change. Um, two lanes of our work are reducing harm within existing public safety systems and redesigning public safety systems that center, safeguard, and empower communities. Two of our sample initiatives that I want to talk about today, um, the Justice Navigator is a flagship product um, that uses policing and administrative data to identify racial inequities in stops and use of force. The Justice Navigator also provides high level, a high level review of agency policies and recommendations for changes. The second initiative is the ComStat for Justice product, which is a comprehensive data-driven partnership with policing agencies to reduce racial inequity. Each, um, it's, each engagement is about three to five years. It includes a mixed methods research, um, policy reviews, and community engagement to create recommendations that address situational risks that oftentimes lead to racial inequities. So um, I would like to introduce the triage response team. Our team is a multidisciplinary team. We are research scientists, race and equity experts, community engagement and policy experts, and data virtuosos. We use data to build a more fair and just system. We partner with law enforcement agencies and communities, and our aim, our goal is to bridge the gap and divide of communication, generational mistrust, and suffering. And this is a lovely picture of our team. So the 2020 Black Lives Matter nationwide protests in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Amar Arbery motivated many cities and officials um, and police chiefs to reach out to CPE to discuss public safety redesign. In 2021, the triage response team was established to expansively um, respond to these sites and community-specific needs and develop data-driven strategies that shift the focus and resources from system, systems of punishment to systems of care. TRT consolidates, um, categorizes, and triages requests that seek to redesign public safety and engage in harm reduction work within policing and local government systems. And we know that redesigning public safety systems takes an out-of-the-box out of approach and thinking and innovation, and oftentimes experimentation. So um, TRT is designed to work dynamically by utilizing the mosaic of strengths of our team. Our bespoke services fall broadly into the following categories, research, consulting and recommendations, community engagement and project coordination. Our services are offered in light touch engagements, which usually require um, one-time commitments or data support. 
thought partnerships for recommendations to tackle specific problems or strategic partnerships, which provide a deeper thought partnership and technical assistance around developing processes and structures to tackle various problems. And now I'll pass it over to um, Liz. Thanks, Juanisha, and thanks for that background. We wanted you all to know a bit about us um, before we jumped into the substance of our, our presentation today. So we know, and you all know, that after a crisis or a traumatic event that involves the police, like the one that Antioch is currently facing, there's often an urgency to respond. And so we wanted to discuss today a few common responses and offer some consideration when thinking about um, those responses. Uh, we're specifically going to talk about consent decrees and civilian oversight. Um, so a consent decree, for those who don't know, is a settlement agreement that's filed in federal court between plaintiffs and the local government agency that's in charge of the police. Consent decrees place a number of mandatory reforms on police agencies. This usually includes training, hiring criteria, promotion criteria, internal review of officers, and sometimes um, different forms of outside scrutiny. So that could be something like auditing the data that is currently being co collected by the department. And these changes typically upgrade police department standards or policies, um, including policies around use of force, as an example. Um, but one thing to consider is that whether these changes lead to improvements in policing is actually an open question. And that's because the research is actually quite limited. Um, we also know that rewriting policies is often not enough. Um, you need training on those policies, but you also need culture change. And that can include um, actual enforcement of the policies once they're enacted and accountability for, for those who do not follow the new policy as updated. The city also has to pay oftentimes an hourly fee for court appointed consultants. And these costs can run in the millions of dollars. And those are funds that could have been invested in the community otherwise. And the focus is often on something that you know, we refer to at CPE is harm reduction. So reducing the harm that policing is causing um, rather than redesign, which we've mentioned a few times and we're going to um, give some examples of. The challenge with that is that it often removes um, local control over what's happening. And in the meantime, these, these agreements can go on for many, many years. Um, the reform landscape can change and new ideas can um, emerge and there may not be opportunity because of the agreement um, to focus elsewhere other than what's in the, the agreement itself. Next slide, please, Juanisha. Thank you. Um, so moving over to civilian oversight, the number of these bodies has increased dramatically since the murder of George Floyd. Several communities have passed measures to establish these boards or to increase the capacity of those that already exist. So some examples include a new review board in Columbus, Ohio, an expansion of the powers of the Oakland Police uh, Commission, in, which is in your neighborhood, and a, and a new oversight board with police and, I'm sorry, with subpoena powers in Portland, Oregon. So there's a wide array of models and structures and a lot of variation in the degree of authority that these bodies have. And at a very high level, what the research tells us um, is that the effectiveness is um, you're more like it's more likely to be effective when there is more authority. But again, you're probably going to detect a theme. Research, um, rigorous research, really doesn't exist on civilian oversight and the merits of the different types of models. The research that does exist has had mixed findings about the ability of civilian oversight to reduce things like excessive force and other forms of police misconduct. Um, boards whose members are appointed by local officials may be biased or susceptible to local politics, or they may be perceived to be that way, which erodes public trust in their independence. But regardless of the oversight model, there are significant structural barriers that often preclude these bodies from fulfilling their mandates and high public expectations of them 
are rarely realized. Um, a challenge is often limited resources, um, particularly for those boards that are dependent on police department or the city council for, for funding. So then the National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, also called NACL, has identified a few features that are important for these boards. Uh, one is independence, two is adequate funding, three is access to personnel and records, um, ability to influence decision-making, authority to carry out the mandate and community and stakeholder support and transparency. Yet even with boards that initially were established in alignment with those characteristics, um, a lot of these boards often fall short of achieving their goals because of inadequate resources, lack of or shifting political support, and amendments to legislation that established them in the first place. And so questions of resources, roles, authority, and function um, must be considered very deliberately and very carefully. Next slide. Thank you. So given some of those constraints, we wanted to share about another path forward, what we've called public safety redesign. And this really seeks to move some of the functions that are currently assigned to police to other organizations, agencies, and community members uh, who may be better equipped to handle them. And we have three examples we wanna share with you today. The first two highlight city and county partnerships. We know there's been you know, some discussion in your group about you know, what can the county do when it comes to law enforcement. And so we wanted to share those examples in particular. The first comes from Ithaca, um, where our team has done some work, um, Ithaca, New York, that is. The, there is a collaborative process to offer recommendations, which we'll tell you more about. And we're also going to share about Atlanta, where there was um, a, a policing alternatives and diversion design team that set up a local pilot. And then finally, we'll talk about Newark, New Jersey, um, where there's a public safety collaborative which is engaging in something called data-informed community engagement. Next slide. Thank you. So let's talk a bit more about Ithaca. Um, the first thing to know about Ithaca is that there was a large scale effort to engage community in a very collaborative process. There were public forums, things like um, 101 briefings by different officials like the mayor, the police chief, and the sheriff to really level set and make sure that community could understand how things were currently happening. There were also open community talking sessions. Most of this was by Zoom because it was during the pandemic, um, but it included Q&A with the mayor and the county administrator. There were surveys for community to participate in, and these were made available both online and through paper versions. And all of the findings um, were summarized on an active website and were printed out and distributed by the library as well. There were also working groups that focused on things like administration, data analysis, research, communications, and law enforcement. And these groups also held town halls and listening sessions of their own. And a data consultant was brought in to analyze 911 and call for service data to see why people were requesting help and whether some of those calls could possibly be diverted. There were also focus groups and these um, really oversampled community members who were most impacted by burdensome policing, people from black and brown communities. And there were also interviews with system actors. And so with support from academic partners, all of, all of this many findings, um, were analyzed and put into reports that were later adopted by both city and county government. And there were 19 recommendations coming out of this process to reimagine public safety, both in the city of Ithaca and Tompkins County. And these included significant changes in law enforcement, um, evaluation of alternative response models, a community healing plan, and an additional uh, community engagement plans. More specifically, the city of Ithaca recommended replacing the police department with a community solutions and public safety department that includes both armed and unarmed units. Tompkins County recommended evaluation and implementation of an alternative response model to address crisis intervention and deliver wraparound health and human services. 
Both the city and the county co-recommended data standardization and transparency mechanisms. They also co-recommended repurposing a SWAT vehicle and um, conducting an external review of SWAT callouts to see how that vehicle was being used. There was also um, an implementation process after the, the um, very in-depth process of creating all of this information. And that has included the creation of a community justice center to lead and complete the work for each recommendation. And that is supported by newly hired staff um, paid for by both the city and the county. Moving on to Atlanta. So in 2015, at the um, prompting of community leaders, um, a group of community leaders, legal system partners, and elected officials traveled from Atlanta to Seattle to learn more about law enforcement assisted diversion, uh, also called LEAD, you may have heard of it, and Atlanta City Council and Fulton County Board of Commissioners then unanimously voted to establish a local um, PAD police assisted diversion design team. The team included representatives from local criminal legal agencies, local governments, neighborhood and faith leaders, and social service providers. And they launched an 18 month process to design the local pilot of a diversion and care navigation strategy. So PAD began accepting diversions in October, 2017 in four Atlanta police department beats and by 2019 had expanded to 28 beats. And then to better understand why people were calling 911 and to look for more diversion opportunities, PAD analyzed about 3.4 million uh, 911 calls in the Atlanta metro area. They learned that 41% of callers had actually dialed a non-emergency police number in the first place, but then were routed to 911 anyway. So as a result of that finding, they partnered with the non-emergency 311 city services line so to launch a community response services. Um, and this was for quality of life concerns related to mental health, to substance use, or extreme poverty. So this gives people an option that is not 911 to call if they see um, a concern that requires a non-law enforcement response. And the Fulton County Board of Commissioners also through this process adopted a resolution in 2021 to create a diversion center in downtown Atlanta. The initiative is a collaborative effort funded by both the city and the county. And according to the initial plan, the, this diversion center will be an alternative option for law enforcement or emergency responders who are called to address issues like substance use, extreme poverty, mental health crises. And rather than taking individuals to jail, people can be treated or receive assistance at the center. And I'll turn it back to you, Anisha. Thank you. Go to the next slide. So I'm going to talk about Newark. Um, the Newark Public Safety Collaborative is a great example of how communities can use data to co-produce comprehensive and dynamic um, and effective crime prevention strategies that are tailored um, to their community. So a public safety collaborative supports efforts to reduce violent crime by using data-informed community engagement, which we refer to as DICE. So DICE is an evidence-based community-centered approach that empowers communities to co-create equitable public safety strategies through data analysis that is transparent and effective and tailored to um, the local problems of a community. DICE empowers community organizations to really become co-producers of public safety by mobilizing their community resources and expertise to problem solve um, some of Newark's most pressing crime issues. DICE is powered by risk terrain modeling, RTM, and delivered via RTMDX software. The RTMDX software um, is used to diagnose crime patterns, identify environmental conditions that can contribute to crime problems, and it also can drive um, decision making for public safety. Um, risk terrain modeling really seeks to reduce crime by focusing on places and not the people in those places. So two examples um, of 
what um, the Newark Public Safety Collaborative was able to establish um, using the um, RTM software is the Newark Community Solutions and South War Children's Alliance. So they're engaged um, in repurposing vacant lots in Newark South Ward based on um, data analytics from the Newark Public Safety Collaborative. Um, they were able to, the data analytics inform their decision making and problem solving efforts at these places. And both organizations collaborated to clean and repurpose vacant lots at the highest, highest risk places in Newark South Ward. And in addition to adding greenery, they added um, free library boxes, murals, and performance stages, and were able to repurpose spaces that were once before known as high-risk locations for potential crime and repurpose them for community areas. So um, this is the closing of our presentation. I am going to stop sharing my screen at, the screen at this time, and then we welcome any questions. Thank you. Uh, yes. Do you all have any data as to the results since a lot of these initiatives were started in 17, 18, or 20? Um, what have been the outcomes as far as crime reduction, um, the number of cases that they have been diverted, successful completion, that sort of information? Yeah, so I can speak to, um, Rob, I'll pass it to you for Ithaca, but I can speak briefly about Atlanta. Um, one thing that was a really amazing outcome of standing up the, their PAD program was that they have actually, it's, it sparked conversations around closing their local municipal jail um, because there were at, at a point just a handful of people because they were diverting them um, to services and the care that they needed. So, um, so that actually led to conversations around closing the municipal jail. They haven't been able to do that yet um, because of local politics, but they are um, figuring that out. And they, um, they did not see any, any increase in crime because of the programming. Um, in fact, they, they feel that people um, are less likely to come back into the system after they've been able to get the care that they need. And Rob, I'll let you talk about Ithaca. Yeah, that's a great question because not often are these programs actually evaluated for the impact they produce. Um, I can say in Ithaca, I spend a great deal of time and in that space, one of, one of the major uh, topics, one of the major one of the major things we sought to do was empower the black community to have a decision-making part in the policy decisions, right? Because that's that's not a thing. It's usually wealthy white people uh, who are elevated to make policy decisions for everyone. And most of those decisions benefit themselves. We empowered the black community to sit at the table and gave them voice in designing this public safety system. And the one thing we saw was the results of the shift of power from, from the wealthy elites to the, to the Black community. There was a great deal of pushback politically. Um, and it almost derailed the process, which is getting back on track now. And I, something I always end with is you can't unempower people, right? So those folks in Ithaca who have been uh, profiled They've been burdened with over policing. They had a chance to sit at the table and have a, have a say in policy making. And although their voices have been tried to and still try to silence them again, you can't unempower people. Uh, and they are pushing hard in Ithaca to get this work done. Uh, as far as evaluations, there is some actually academic evaluations on risk frame modeling in Newark Public Safety Collaborative. And it, ha it has uh, reduced community violence in the area, impacted area in which they've studied from anywhere between 30 to 35%, with that an increase in, in arrests. So, so that program specifically uh, targets places that creates an opportunity for crimes to occur, doesn't target people. Uh, 
so what we used to talk about was vacant lots oftentimes or a vacant lot and abandoned cars on the same corner create an opportunity for crime. When the vacant lot and the car are um, abated, they've seen incredible amounts of success in that. Um, we are in the process, Juanisha uh, is in the process of building out a public safety collaborative in St. Louis uh, because St. Louis is a very organized community. And, and we hope to see even better results in St. Louis uh, using that method. And I, I think one issue can pull it off. Thanks, Rob. And I can actually jump in here and say that with the way the Public Safety Collaborative is run, so I mentioned the risk terrain modeling software. So communities choose about three to four areas of crime specifically that they want to target. Um, the crime is run into the, the crime data is run into the software pinpointing those areas, and it puts out a monthly analysis. So with Newark specifically, they actually make the analysis um, public to the community. I can drop the um, link in the chat, but they make it monthly. They up they upload the crime data and show the change in percentages. So they do make it public so that the community can follow along and see the changes in rates um, that they are experiencing drops in violent and property crime um, on a at a monthly count level. So I can I'll drop that link in the chat if anyone wants to check it out. Gigi. Gigi. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I uh, appreciate the presentation and I have all kind of ideas about how we could improve outcomes, especially in Antioch. And, and I don't want us to forget it wasn't just Antioch, it was also Pittsburgh that has officers. So anywhere a large number of African Americans live in, in, in impoverished areas, you often will have a lot of uh, bad acting police officers. That's just that's just what has been my experience. So I started thinking about in my role as the executive director at NAMI, who's harmed most. And so any opportunity to look at African Americans who live with mental health challenges has already risen to the top for me because I know what our criminal justice system looks like with so many people who are impacted by mental health challenges who are criminalized for living with a mental illness. So we got some excited news about um, the state passing unanimously excited delirium that we won't excuse the behavior of bad officers when they use excessive force and blame the victim. So I'm more policy driven. And so I've been working with the family to try and figure out how could we in this county do away with that excuse for murder, excited delirium and other things that are often used more often on BIPOC communities and mostly African-Americans and Latinx communities. And so has there been any work you've done across the nation around, specifically around mental health and um, really addressing um, the, the challenges that come up when excessive force is used on individuals who live with mental illness and the um, Black and brown community, because we get the call that NAMI, we're getting quite a few increase. Just because their knowledge about the text messages doesn't mean the behaviors have stopped. Yes, um, I can actually speak to that. Um, I worked on the CompStat for Justice program that I briefly talked about. I'm a part of that program. You know, we partnered with the police department to look at some of the disparities in their data. But one of the things in the community specifically, we partnered with. Um, Norfolk, Virginia, and we were seeing that a lot of times, you know, they were having interactions, whether it was mental health, dealing with unhoused populations or substance abuse. And what a goal of the project is to make sure that we have the most relevant actors at the table. So we intentionally involved mental health specialists and mental health organizations in the conversations surrounding redesign and public safety to see what those organization pain points were and how they were interacting with police in the communities that they specifically serve. So as we um, talked about, you know, giving a seat at the table to those who are most impacted is always a priority, but just specifically, because I worked on that program, that was something that I was tasked with doing, going out in the community, finding the organizations that are serving those that are impacted by mental illness and making sure that our responses are reflective of the needs of these particular individuals. So that is work that we prioritize and that we do when we engage with cities. 
Um, real quick, we are also helping the city of St. Louis set up. A, first of all, let me say thank you for your work at NAMI. What, what a great organization and, and really caring people. Uh, we're working in St. Louis to help them set up an alternative response program. They, like most cities, they went to a co-response, a police officer and a clinician. And, and now we're helping them get to a place where they don't uh, dispatch police as just a clinician. And also I'm, I'm trying to get into their head uh, every chance I can to tell them that you have to go one step further in, in which you provide access to healthcare, access to services to people to help them manage their disease. So they actually don't have to call 911 and don't ever go into crisis again. And I think that's a big step that most people forget. They respond to the crisis instead of going one step past that and really help people manage their disease and how that disease manifests. Um, and I think if we can get to that, we're gonna see huge reductions, huge reductions. If people, people just need help managing their disease. Thank you. Well, then. Yeah, um, thank you for the presentation. A couple of questions came up for me. Um, you mentioned like in Ithaca that there was a lot of community engagement, but the local politics in that area was basically trying, well, it was your words, but basically trying to kill the process of what it sounded like. So I guess I was just wondering if, first question, could you just expand like if you're not having political willpower from a local agency to look in some of these policy directions, what does that work look like? interfacing with the community and building community partnerships. And the second question is, you mentioned that some advisory boards would be created or came together, especially after John Floyd, uh, George Floyd and Breonna Taylor being killed, but sometimes the effectiveness was based on the resources that a board would have. So I guess, what is your definition of adequate resources to make an advisory board that much more effective? If you could summarize the answers tonight. <laughs> Rob, do you want to take the first one on Ithaca? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. What was it? Can you, can you hit, me, hit me up with the Ithaca question again? Uh, basically, you said there wasn't like political willpower to move yeah. some of these recommendations forward, but the community was still empowered to do something to push for these policies and practices. So the question is, is like if you're running into a roadblock where the local decision makers refuse to entertain these ideas, how does that work? Transfer, what does the collaboration look like along with interfacing with the local agency for in y'all experience? So in Ithaca, we had a, a champion for the policy change in the mayor's office who towards the end of the process uh, resigned his position and a more Laura was a, Laura is a wonderful person she just didn't have the drive and the self-efficacy that the, the, the former mayor had uh, she wasn't the champion quite the champion that Savante was so we the, the mayor got us to a point then there was a change in leadership uh, fortunately one of our uh, theories of change involves finding a strong champion for the cause, a, a policy entrepreneur that can actually drive the change in inside government. So we'll look really hard and find that person. And at the same time, we ground our work in the community. So the community can hold, that, and we don't ground it, we center all of our work in, in the community, and not just overall community, the black and brown community that actually experienced this burdensome policing. And, and they will, and our theory is they will hold the government accountable to any changes that uh, that come up or are recommended. And that's worked really well. The one thing that we've changed a little bit is uh, who represents community. In Ithaca, we used individual people stepped up and they wanted to be part of the process. And, and those black people who stepped up, we found some of them were re-traumatized by being in this space. and be in the same space with police officers that created their trauma uh, and they fell out of the process. And so we actually regrouped 
And in our next in our next project, we use community advocates. So people who represent larger groups instead of individual community members. And we think that worked just a little better. At least I felt better. We weren't re-traumatizing people and we didn't see people fall out of the process. So that's that's a lesson we learned the hard way. I, I, I still talk to some of the community members. They call me and um, from Ithaca. And that's that really, it, it stung. It stung a lot. And then on the question yeah. about the oversight boards and kind of what does resource, like what does sufficiently resource mean? I, there's definitely local context, so it's hard to say from place to place. But I think two things that would be important to think about are dedicated staffing. So to make sure that you have people who that is their job to lead the board and that they aren't just, you know, volunteering because they care a lot, which is also important, but, you know, making sure um, that you have staff, someone to staff it and keep it, keep the work moving, as well as a budget specific for that body, um, so that it, they're not dependent on another organization or um, entity to, to provide resources um, and and political support is also important to think about because you know political winds can change, um, and then there may not be that support. So thinking about consistency and sustainability, and making sure that the body is independent and can continue to exist regardless of what else might be happening. Thank you. Thank you, Gigi. I have another question. Um, be, just because of the blatant racism in this county and working with closely with the African American community, we've started a process called 40 Voices to Get an African American Holistic Wellness Hub so that when issues come up, the pain that's experienced could be absorbed through healing centers throughout the county. Do you have any thoughts on some of the ingredients that should be included in that and how we would fight for the funding? to make sure that that happens because at every angle, whether it's criminal justice, we just came out of COVID, African-Americans suffered most in mental health, African-Americans suffer most in juvenile hall, African-Americans are represented there more. So sometimes it makes more sense to just do it yourself than rely on systems that are designed to do exactly what they have been doing, which is harming the community. Have you given any thought to that kind of higher level? I mean, of course, after what happened with Antioch, I went all over trying to get funding, like, let's get in there now and let's let's try and start a healing process. And everywhere I went where they have stored dollars, there was no funds available to start that process. So had we had that in place, we could have started doing some of the work. I do want to give a really big shout out to Alan, who came to each one of our healing sessions along with Brandon and gave great comfort, especially to the young people who, who, who wanted to have their answers um, to start the healing process. Some people are still stuck. So I understand you know, the trauma that comes up, but there's many of us who, who, who want to, um, we heal from helping others. And so we won't be traumatized or we won't be fearful and run away. But I think African-American Holistic Wellness Hub is part of the answer. Any thoughts from you all? Uh, first of all, I love that idea um, because it, it's it's needed. In, in Ithaca, we're they actually kept our healing plan. We, we there was a healing plan in there. We brought a uh, a specialist in, Dr. Acosta, and he was on the ground speaking to people, having circles, and the big plan was to have circles for the community, circles for law enforcement. And the long range plan was try to bring them together in a facilitated circle and try to heal together. Uh, I don't know if they're there yet. I, I know they're not there yet. I'm not sure if they'll ever get there, but that was the long range plan. And I, I'm a big believer in, in healing and really uh, hearing people's truths. Uh, and I think it's gotta be a big part of this process. And it's overlooked a lot because I don't know if people don't believe that the black community has suffered trauma or I, I don't know why it's overlooked so much other than just the blatant racism and the system is designed to uh, traumatize black people in, in order to keep the status quo. Uh, and I'm, I, here, I, I don't want to sound like 
<laughs> I'm, I'm giving a, a lecture again because you all know you know that you've lived that uh, and funding is always tough for something like that it's not a priority for the government right it, so it, it's back to that status quo conversation but it, it's a big part we included in the ethical plan and and I think that it can make a huge difference yeah, um, the only thing I would add is that, again, um, as Rob mentioned, funding is truly a tough one. Um, that's a question that we get a lot when we are talking to cities about redesigning public safety, especially with response to mental health. Um, I know it goes without saying, but trying to go to your local officials, because there's a lot of funding opportunities. And oftentimes at the end of the fiscal year, there is money available that people don't know about unless you go and ask. And I mean, I'm not saying, you know, sit outside the door and wait on someone because sometimes it's kind of off-putting, but hey, sometimes you have to go very grassroots to get, you know, the answers that you need. But also, if you haven't thought about looking um, at the federal level for funding, I know SAMHSA often has micro grants and micro opportunities for funding that are particularly related to mental health. And also um, maybe going to some of the organizations that are already offering mental health services and partnering with them to fund a portion of your initiative and receiving small funding sources from those organizations that have additional funds. I've seen that work um, locally to me in my community before. So sometimes when you have mental health authorities, they're called different things in different places, but they're often given funds that they can use for smaller initiatives. So if you have your healing um, initiative that you wanna do, if it's like set up as a 501c3, that would be a way to go as well, to go to local mental health organizations. And again, I hope that's helpful. Federal funding is always super scary, but SAMHSA is a really good one, and they have a lot um, of opportunities. Yeah, we just applied for their 50000 Thank you, Juanisha. We also went to this county that's had a difficult time hiring staff for our A3 program, so we know they're selling savings, but there's no desire to have their funding. Thanks. Thank you. And I have a question for me. Um, Rob, Liz, Wanisha. In terms of looking at the common police reform efforts, you talked a little about consent decrees and some of the challenges you've seen with consent decrees. Are there any of these agencies that you studied, um, perhaps the track they took in Newark for um, reforming or shifting when they have a really substantial portion? For example, in Antioch, nearly half of officers are, are participating and involved in these text messages or the FBI investigation or other um, pieces of, of racism, misconduct, or corruption. So are there models that you see that are promising and best practice? Again, when you have um, you know, a, a chief right now in, in a police agency locally with a, a large swath of staff that were engaged in something. I think I would point to Camden, New Jersey, in which the entire police department was, uh, they did away with the entire police department and they built it from scratch. That's how bad things are. Um, and I don't think it was as bad as Antioch, um, right? So they, everyone had to reapply for their positions. They brought in Al Ann Milgram, who is currently the, the um, head of DEA. And she, she, she's a civil rights attorney and she was the acting police chief as they rebuilt the Camden Police Department. It's a very interesting case study. Um, getting that is going to be, it's really unusual. As, New, as you know, New Jersey Attorney General Office has a great deal of influence over the day-to-day uh, -day operations of police departments. I, I I guess you can't do that everywhere. However, we like to lean on, it's more important to change behaviors than hearts and minds, right? Hold people accountable. And hopefully when you can change behaviors, hearts and minds will follow. Uh, but it's that accountability portion that's often left out of police departments. 
that low level street level accountability is the most important. Um, and I see a lot of, I saw a bill on canine usage in California. Um, that wouldn't be a problem if low level police first level sergeants were actually holding their people accountable. You would never get to the point where they, they were trying to make use of a canine dog illegal. Uh, so it, I always come back to accountability for, for any of these problems. If, if people were doing their jobs correctly, um, it, you would have far less, far less problems. Thank you. And are there any um, bills that CPE has looked at in California recently? I know someone on your team mentioned supporting a bill that would help reduce racial disparities in, in traffic stops. Yeah, we did sign on that bill. Uh, I think someone testified in Sacramento. We just were working on this same a similar bill in Connecticut and New York with, uh, with a coalition of community groups all around those low level traffic stops. And I think that's a great place to start because so many low level traffic stops are what uh, police call fishing expeditions, right? They, they, they have no intention of writing someone a ticket for a air freshener hanger from their rear view mirror. All their intention is to stop that person and get consent to search their car. Uh, and our data, we have the largest database on police behaviors in the world. And most of our data, our data is clear that uh, black people are searched at extremely high rates. It, it, pedestrian stops and vehicle stops. However, uh, elements of a crime are found at such low levels compared to when police search white people, which we like to say is the level of suspicion for pulling over a black person and searching the black person is so much lower than it is for white people. Um, so it, those, those, uh, th those bills around pretextual stops are so important. Uh, the Commonwealth of Virginia has has statewide ban on pretext stops. Philadelphia, Berkeley, and LA, I think, are the big ones that rolled it out. And crime's not running rampant, right? It, it's it, vehicle accidents have not gone up because it, so little of that involves safety. It's all about pulling black people over and searching their cars in search of finding some element of a crime, which most of the time is not there. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for having us today. Um, we do have another meeting that we're gonna hop for, but I will, well, Ellen has our contact info, but I'll just quickly put my email address in the chat. If anything else comes up, any more questions that you can think of, just feel free to email me directly and I'll put it in the chat really quickly. Thank you so much, Juanisha and Liz and Rob for presenting today. We really appreciate your time and your work. Thank you all for having us. You guys have an amazing rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I know we did Q and A. Um, should we open it up for public comment at this time? I'm not sure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for changing. <laughs> <laughs> newbie here i'm getting it together i'm trying to like rethink how this thing go um so at this time we'll open it up for public comment okay, there's no one in the room that's raising their hand okay. oh Gigi. just because um what's unfortunate in antioch i participated in reimagine antioch and it's was already a plan for some um, police accountability efforts through the commission, but the individuals have to go through the mayor for appointment. Now, because of what's happening, all of his attention has been taken off of appointing, but would it make sense for the mayor to be the person if they're so connected with the police? But how would a, how would a, a independent body launch such an effort and then pick people who are not compromised by having a relationship with mayor? 
I mean, that's kind of like I think that's the point of one of their considerations of it was the political influence that right. could be presented depending on how that board is. Like I'm, not, I'm not a bowing for opposition. <laughs> <laughs> I would never be appointed, but I mean. Well, I mean, just in response to that, because every city has a different method to the mm -hmm. madness and how they go about their process. And a lot of the times just putting on the organizer hat, it's like if the city or local agency doesn't recognize it, then it unfortunately becomes incumbent and the responsibility of advocates and community members to like create that meeting where they are talking about these hard things and then constantly pushing against the public process saying you wouldn't appoint us, but we've been meeting anyway, talking about this and here's what we got and just continually creating that public process and push until it's like, okay, yeah, let's get something more officially established in the city. So if the mayor isn't doing that, then it's going to be like one of those things like, okay, well, we'll meet anyway and we'll get back to you when we have a plan put together and just keep on pushing. Yeah, I think that showed up. And I mean, it showed up in Richmond because there were two separate yeah, I mean, you. I know you were part of that process, yeah. but there were kind of two separate groups. So there was kind of this first group of reimagine Richmond. Oh, well, I don't even know what they were called, but that, that first group of reimagine Richmond, then kind of a second group uh, that was appointed by different people. And um, you know, I think there were some bumps and you know things that happened, but I do think they were trying to figure out ways how they can work with each other because the separate group could act in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. um, and not have certain, like the Brown Act and things mm -hmm. kind of um, guard them. And I think also with this group as well, because it started off with the Racial Justice Coalition. Um, and then there's this body and Racial Justice Coalition still meets and shows up to these different meetings and things. So um, yeah, I think there's like this inside outside kind of planning that mm -hmm. needs to happen. Cheryl. I see Cheryl and then Doug. Um, I, I always uh, give pause to these conversations about pretextual stops because pretextual stops tend to give a an air that the officers don't know why they're stopping someone in the first place. That they are, you know, that that that's uh, you know, I, I guess the legal reason is that it's a stop, it's for some sole purpose of of you know, some unrelated investigation. They know why they're stopping people. They know why they're stopping them. They know that he's a is a black or brown um person or a person that's it's they want to stop for some for some nefarious reason and that is serving some purpose other than some official legal reason. So it's not a pretextual stop. It's an actual illegal reason for stopping. So saying so I think that you know this whole conversation about trying to change someone who's been trained from the very outset to conduct these stops is is um, is missing the whole point of what we're trying to do. That happens in training. That happens from the very outset. So that is where we are trying to, you know, this whole thing about reimagine and re rechange. You can't change something until you get in there and tell them it's illegal. We we can name it anything we want to. We can give them all kind of pretty words and throw some of these pink flowers from my background on it. It doesn't change the fact that it's illegal. And so I think the one thing that I grabbed out of this presentation is the thing about accountability. If it doesn't have any teeth to it, all of these rules and laws that we keep throwing at, um, not just officers, but everybody in the criminal legal system, if it doesn't have any consequences, not just accountability, because accountability is nothing if there's no consequences, 
to the actions, then what are we doing? So what I want to do, especially with this body, is what are the consequences that we're recommending? That you can't just keep hemming people up, stopping them and ruining their lives because they, there's something that you've been told that a certain person who looks a certain way deserves to be treated a certain way. That's what this is supposed to be doing. And so that's the conversation I would like for us to have and the recommendations I would like for us to make. Thank you. Craig? Yeah, thank you, Sheila. Um, I just want to thank the Racial Justice Oversight Body for arranging for this presentation uh, to have this um, uh, opportunity for this board to think about and study the possibility of um, what this the presenters called uh, public safety redesign, to think about that in our county um, and the possibility of having our cities uh, consider, the, including Antioch, but not limited to Antioch, consider such a thing as well. Uh, so that's very positive. And uh, um, I, I look forward to the racial justice oversight body pursuing uh, considerations of this kind beyond just this, this uh, presentation. Um, the emphasis on um, the need for cultural change in our um, law enforcement is very important. And um, I think that's something that we need to work on. Thank you. Any more public comments in the room? Um, next, we want to move to item four on the agenda. I which think is Chris to... had his hand up. Oh, sorry. sorry no, no, Chris. no. You, 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 there, no apology necessary. <laughs> uh, I was I was trying to navigate my screen to turn off my mute. And it took long. <laughs> you know, I'm, I move fast. I move fast. I'm like, that's, that's time. You, you, you are, you, you are a, a great facilitator. You're doing a great job. Thank you for, for stepping up in this role. Um, you know, two, two, two co-chairs, two chairs right now. Um, you two chairs, but you got you a few on. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, I, I think I'm probably going to segue into where you were going next. Anyway, I think the two items are connected because I think one of the ways, you know, that we have, um, you know, an opportunity to, to begin to, um, you know, at least make public uh, some level of recommendation or push um, in response to this is with the public statement. But before even, um, you know, moving on to, to that, just to say, uh, I appreciate everything that all of you shared, uh, I, I think, you know, with a lot of revision here in, you know, the next several minutes, uh, we can probably incorporate a lot of the ideas that you guys said in some way or another, or at least allude to them in that. Um, and then, you know, further support that by showing up to the spaces where this, um, you know, where the statement will be received uh, to give, you know, context and to further flesh out, you know, what some of the asks are. Uh, but I would also say, you know, in, in terms of that cultural shift, I think that's extremely important. Uh, I think all of the things that uh, all of you guys have raised here within the last 15 minutes or so are all, you know, the right things and are very important. Um, I, I think for me, the thing is cultural shift, which is, you know, so much of this is the most difficult thing to mandate or to even measure or to, you know what I mean, to 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 make happen, right? It, it's one of the things that requires, I think, a lot more uh, exposure to the concepts and the ideas as much as possible and patience. But it's hard to say we are going to change culture in the local, um, you know, police department by 30% by the end of 2025. Cause it's like, how do you even measure what would 20, you know what I mean? Like what, so it's so nebulous um, that there's there's just a need to, to think 
uh, outside of the box to be very creative and to attack it from as many different entry points as possible, as many different ways uh, as we can think about, um, you know, just sort of making sure that that folks are being inclusive uh, and acknowledge uh, the suffering that has been caused, um, you know, to understand history and history's impact on even the way that we see race uh, in this country, all of these different things, right? It would take all of that and then any number of things, um, you know, that I'm not even, you know, aware of or thinking about that you guys, um, you know, could probably think of and bring to the table to get to that place. Um, so it, it's something that can be done over time, but it takes, it, it's, it's, it will take a lot of persistence and it'll take a lot of creativity and just continuing to uh, to monitor and look at it and and, and update uh, even what the approaches are uh, as we see uh, certain results. So just wanted to name that. Uh, and then, um, you know, if there's nothing further, I'm ready to uh, to sort of jump into the um, the statement. So hopefully you all got a, got a chance to to look at um, the the draft in the agenda um, in advance. Because I think, um, you know, I I started with the draft. Uh, there's been some revision, um, you know, which is the revised version is what you see. But for those of you who have who have not um, done something like this, at least um, in this space before or with me, uh, I always find it worthwhile to say, like, I'm not married to the language here like the the point of this is not to show you something that is about to you know uh that has to look like this and is going forward but it is for you to look at it um you know and just for the for this to be a starting place for you to say okay we need these revisions or i need we need to take this out we need to add this because this is your document right this is meant to be reflective and representative of uh your thoughts um feelings needs and your response to this uh, particular crisis uh, and how you would like to see things move forward. And so you need to be heard on it, right? And so that's that's the point. So don't feel married to the language that's here. Uh, take every opportunity that you need uh, in reading it. If you feel like, you know, there's a, there's a literal or figurative I that needs to be dotted or T that needs to be crossed, um, you know, that that's what this time is for, is to engage in doing that. Um, and okay, I was I was gonna do it, but it's it is all <laughs> go for it, Christina. Uh, I think it's page. Yeah, you got it. Um, is everybody able to see that? Like, and when I say see it, I mean read it. Particularly for those of you who are virtual, is that big enough? Do you need us to zoom any? That's better. Yeah, bigger, bigger is kind of always <laughs> better. With it. For those in the room, if you need a copy, we do have a couple in the package. Yeah, this is helpful. Gigi has her hand up. Okay. Go yeah. Everybody on the board have one? Yeah, right. Okay, great. Right. There you go. You're welcome. As I as I mentioned earlier, it's not just the Antioch Police Department, and it's not just several. It's like maybe more than a third of the force, maybe even half of the force. So I think be more specific about Antioch and Pittsburgh with Antioch having so many of their um, officers be implicated in this. But, and, and I'd feel comfortable with saying, and we don't know. Where else in the in the counties we test? Usually, if you see one rat, there's many more running around. You don't see, and I don't pretend to think that they, you know, they look at city boundaries and say, "I'm not going over into this city or that city." So, in that first opening statement, I think if we said something about we can donate anywhere, and we're aware that it's happened in Antioch with a vast majority, really, of their officers, and in Pittsburgh. Oh, people are agreeable about that. Yeah, I don't think it mentioned Antioch in particular. It just said in the county. Kind of Maybe I'm looking at the wrong 
It's at the bottom, the last line in the first paragraph. Oh, okay. I think I think I caught most of that. Uh, they got a little. Uh, audio got a little little muddled there toward the end but i so i will i will ask uh for like some clarifying questions here because what i want to make sure i'm doing is um you know sort of changing language to some degree uh maybe even in real time um we don't we don't want to have to uh have you know Ideally, we wouldn't have to have another meeting, you know, to, you know, we'd be able to get this done. Um, and that's not, I, I'm not intending to rush you guys in terms of thinking about it. I'm saying if we can come to an agreement, it would be nice to be able to move this to the next step as opposed to needing another month or more to come back and talk about it. So um, specifically in that last sentence, right? Instead of, so one of the things I heard is instead of saying several, maybe there's a, a another word that better encompasses that this was a large portion of, uh, right? Several sounds like more than a few, right? As opposed to like a, a large amount. Um, and so in terms of words or phrases that we could put in there instead of several, right? Um, I, I'm open to suggestions. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is is multiple or many, something like that. Um, but Gigi, uh, in particular, because you raised it and certainly is open to everyone else, um, you know, wondering how either of those words or or some other phrase would land on you. Wasn't it more than a third of their police department? Yeah. Yeah. There were, by our review of the text messages, there were 44 officers um, on or participating in some way in the text messages, those were the neat number of needs that we got. I know the DA's office is here too. I'm yeah, yeah, happy to have them weigh in. So the report can indicate, um, and I think some news reports have said 20% have been placed on leave, and then mm -hmm. up to 40% yeah. may have been implicated with touching and uh, mm -hmm. with sending and receiving. So I think if um, a suggestion that I would offer is it may not get to the quantity mm -hmm. that you were thinking, but I think you could say involving officers of the Antioch Police Department and Pittsburgh Police Department. Um, Can't you just say that East County, I, I helped write a press release for our central committee out in, in um, our DP Triple C, and we did do exactly with that. We, we named Antioch and Pittsburgh. And it just said officers. It took out the word several. It said officers of the Antioch in Pittsburgh. It didn't say several at all. A significant number. Melvin has had. Was that alarming? I mean, any amount is alarming. <laughs> I mean, that's the word that came up for me, too, was saying a significant number of officers in Antioch and Pittsburgh are tied to this. Um, in general, I'm OK with going with the will of the group and modifying this to make it more punchy. But the thing that was missing for me personally was not just the racist text messages, yes. news that came out about actually falsifying evidence against community members who are primarily black and black and brown. Like racism is one thing, but you took an action outside of that to go as far as you can to ruin somebody's life. And that I believe needs to be named because that also just decimates the public trust in me. It's like, I can't even trust that you're gonna go about your job ethically when I'm standing in front of you. Right. So uh, thank you, Melvin, because that's exactly where I was going to go next is to, that it should say something about where it says racist. It, it was racist, sexist, xenophobic, homophobic, and unethical. I know there was more, but I think if you're going to call it out, call it out. Okay. Uh, so Melvin, here's a, here's a question for you. Uh, Lois or Russell? Who, who just spoke? Melvin, who was who, who was just on the mic? Willis. Willis. 
Um, you know, well played. Uh, so in the in the <laughs> second in the second paragraph, uh, the third sentence. Okay. So, yeah. We, we know that these were not just meaningless words between officers, but are indicative of racial bias and animus, which has far reaching implications as to how these officers perform their duties and may well have directly impacted the disparate outcomes for communities of color, which this body was assembled to address. Uh, do you feel like we need stronger language in addition to that or that you'd like to move this sentence or does the sentence kind of get at uh, the idea that you were putting forward? Um, or need modification in any way? I mean, I guess as a general overview, I think the only thing that I would eliminate is may well and just say and have had a direct impact on disparate outcomes for our communities of color, which this body was assembled to address because they have had impacts, not may well have, but that's just me personally, because yeah. being more direct about the impact that has happened. And to Cheryl's point, um, just wanted to add all of the all of the words that you threw out, um, or at least you know making sure that we're all we're all good with that revision. Can, can we also add? I have to go to another meeting. Because of it happening in Antioch and Pittsburgh, you may have gone off, but it, it does break up fear that it's much more widespread. We're we're just aware of those two, but if we're condemning it, we're condemning it for everywhere in this country. So some way of saying that, it, although it was identified there, there's a belief carried by some community members that it's everywhere and we want to condemn no matter where it may be found in this county. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Um, so to that point. So I, I go for it. So I, uh, I I'm reading both the press release and this right here. So I'm the racial justice in this capacity, hardworking or nice. Um, I, I I get the profoundly disheartened, but I want to use strong language about the condemnation and the um. And the and to say something about how vehemently we decree um, that you know the actions and I, I recent news of the races. You already add, are you editing this in in real time? I, I'm doing my we best. Can't, we can't see it. That's why I'm asking. Oh, I know. I know. Um, and actions of their officers strongly condemn this behavior in any form, but most especially among law enforcement agencies. I would say something here to, to Gigi's point um, in any area. Right, okay, so to that point, um, cause uh, okay, so if you look at the if you look at the third paragraph, because I think it it, and we can move these sentences. Like I don't I don't care where they are. I just think um, if something if something's already there, then maybe we can add it. You know where it flows. So there's this. You know we also believe it's important to state in the first sentence and third paragraph that this incident only confirms the often unacknowledged complaints, allegations, and suffering of Black and Brown community members who are fully aware of the existence of such blatant racism uh, based on their experiences, but whom so often do not have the evidence to prove it. So it feels like right there would be the optimum place to say, this may not even, you know, this is, um, you know, in terms of Pittsburgh and Antioch, this is where that evidence has, has been made public, uh, but there may even be, you know, more, or, you know, perhaps that that kind of captures the spirit of what it is that you're trying to say. Um, so well, thought about. Yeah, Chris, but if you say that, then you say who do not have the evidence to prove it or have such evidence ignored. Because I don't think it's always necessarily true that they don't have the evidence to prove it is ignored because what they did was they, they actually um, invented evidence or they suppressed evidence. Right. So, so what if, so what if instead of uh, often unacknowledged, we say often ignored? 
uh, yeah. complaint allegations. There so. you go. Okay. You. Um, um, and are we saying anything in here? Uh, I didn't see it, but I, I did want to make sure we had made mention of uh, decreeing the officers who were involved in the ongoing corruption investigations of alleged fraud, bribery, drug distribution, and civil rights violations that are related to the use of force, which is separate from the text messaging. Right. Okay. Do you want me to send it to you? I was just going to say, you know, uh, so adding some, uh, you know, some of these uh, can, additions can, in the chat. I can, um, I can send it to you. I have it. I'll type it up really fast. Yeah, you can, you can just type it in the chat. That way everybody can see it in case there's any any further, uh, you know, edits or thoughts that need to be shared. And then we can just put it right in there. Absolutely. And that, that also makes it, you know, relatively uh, quick so that we can keep it moving. I, I really would, uh, I mean, I want this to be right more so than I want it to be fast, but I also don't want us to take, you know, I don't want us to have to call another meeting to to kind of get to the place where it actually can move forward. Oh, we only have this Q and A thing. Yeah, um, but I, I I think we all should still be able to see any anything you put in there, just like it is a regular chat. Mm -hmm. In the in the meantime, uh, if there are, if there are any other thoughts or if there's additional feedback, by all means, please, uh, you know, please give it to us. Well, I'll just say thank you for wrapping up the letter and also doing some real time editing because I know that's extensive. So I don't have anything to add personally. Just a thank you, Chris. For yeah, li literally, you know, part of my job. So there's no no need to thank me. And it doesn't matter how extensive it is. Uh, the, again, the point is to to reflect the things that you guys want to say. Um, you know, and try to do so without being redundant, which is why. You know, as sometimes you you mention things, if it's if it's there, maybe in some form and can be edited. I just want to make sure to point that out to you guys. But again, not opposed to adding or taking out anything uh, based on, you know, what you guys have to say. And um, I will also just point out, right, that we, we do still have, you know, members of the public who, you know, may want to be heard as well, um, you know, when that time comes. So as we, you know, continue to ask members of the body to give feedback, you know, as that feedback, you know, sort of uh, wraps, um, just to remember to uh, to open it up for, for public comment as well. We can actually do that now. If we don't have any other members um, have any other suggestions. We can open up for public comment right now uh, while Cheryl is putting things in the chat. So do we have any public comment from non-board members? I don't see any hand raised on my end. Anybody in the room? No. Okay, perfect. And I do see this as a voting item. So we'll wait for the edits to be made. Chris, will you be? Oh, I see Stephanie has her hand up. 
I just, you know, just real the general comments as just a member of the of the public. I I, I just think really I, in the letter, you know, I think the letter is amazing. I read it twice last night, and um, I, I I do think it should be a little bit more specific about what what has occurred in Antioch with the number of officers. Um, I think also just where it's appropriate, stressing um, the harm and the harm that's been done and from people that you've directly heard from or people you haven't heard from. Um, you know, I think the youth in, in, in Antioch, the young people in school, they're, I, I've attended a listening session. I mean, they're, they're scared. They're downright scared of the police. And I don't know how that would be worked in. Um, and I guess also just, um, just the total break in trust. I mean, the very entity that, and I've said this before, that's supposed to protect and serve is doing just the opposite. And um, I don't, I just, I think that really needs to be stressed um, because I think that's what, I think in societies, that's where there's a disconnect. I mean, some people view the police as, as, as protecting them and other people see the police as the, as the very first line of harm. And those traffic stops, I think, are a very, very vivid, clear example. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And I, I do just want to thank everyone for all the, the work that they're doing. It's, I, it's, it's not easy. I just want to quickly thank Stephanie for giving a donation to supply the pizzas for us when we had the conversation with the police chief and the youth. We had to get the funding from a private citizen. Thank you, Stephanie. You're welcome. You're welcome. In response to that comment, I have some language that we, our office had drafted for letters that we've sent that I'm happy to uh, pair it in, Chris, if you think it's helpful. Um, so initially we talked about the reports revealing a deeply entrenched department-wide culture of racism, homophobia, targeted violence against Black people, selective enforcement of laws against Black people, fabrication of evidence, an utter disregard of civil and human rights. And then in terms of the number of officers involved, um, there were 45 APD officers. There are officers that are not on APD on those texts, by the way, and the texts are redacted and we still don't have all of the texts. But from what we know right now, there were 44 Antioch Police Department officers on the text chains disclosed thus far. There are officers that run the gamut from patrol officers to lieutenants. Um, there are There is the president of the Antioch Police Officers Association and Antioch Police Department Sergeant, Internal Affairs Sergeant. Um, and if you, if you look based on the Antioch Police Department website, at least 16 of the 44 officers are in leadership roles at Antioch, such as detective, sergeant, or lieutenant. So th those were just some of the um, facts that we dissected when we kind of pulled out the initial texts. Initially, we had 45 names, but one officer has two different last names, or same last name and two different first names. And we've since been informed it was one person, not two people. So I don't know if the DA's office has any other facts to add to the kind of um, breakdown of the officers from the information they can share. That's what we have. Any other thoughts on that language? Sounds good to me. Just a matter of uh, where to place it, but um, yeah, I would love to include some of some of the the language that you used, Ellen. Thank you. Hey, Chris. This is Christina. I just want to double check to see if you can see what's in the Q and A box that uh, I can. Carol provided. Okay, great. Thanks. And I cannot copy it uh you know directly so i am you know switching back and forth to you know type a few words at a time but i got it uh, 
I forgot the number of officers in Antioch that uh, were actually active. Was it 90? At the time that we um, had the 44 names, there were 99 officers in Antioch. I think there were more allocated positions, but at the time of the text, I know that's a real moving target because um, a lot of folks are- It was already something there. like 20% of the force who was already on administrative leave for other issues, right? Yeah, we've had a lot of difficulty getting information about who's actually on leave. That's one of the things I've continually requested, but I know there are certainly a, a, a larger number of officers on leave. Yeah, so I was just thinking, you know, that's basically half of your whole police force, which um, leaves you right now pretty undressed to, to say, you know, kind of like, or unprepared or, un, you know, staffed. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you got a city that's operating at half capacity, which had already had issues uh, uh, serving the public in a safety, public safety, uh, you know, realm. Uh, it's just incredible. And and they're getting paid. So you pay them not to be there. It's incredible. You know, so, you know, you just compound it by compound. And, you know, it's just, it's, 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 it's mind blowing. Yeah. Be a paid investigation. Didn't the uh I forgot his name, the responder for the didn't he say it was the worst that he's identified in the nation? Yeah, I mean I think I think we have to remind people yeah. this is not a small thing. It's never happened before anywhere else. It's the worst act of police corruption ever in the nation that's been reported. I, I wouldn't have a problem with that being included. Hear you loud and clear. Thanks. Okay. Um, so this is going to take me a few more minutes if not longer to to get this all down um what i might recommend is if there is uh, any additional conversation that we could have or another agenda item that maybe we could move to and then come back toward the end of this meeting i could try to um you know reflect back to you guys what you have said and maybe share the screen and show you uh the new language in real time um uh, and maybe you know there's time for a vote in like you know eight to 10 minutes. Um, if not, um, then, you know, we can, uh, if, if, if everybody hasn't been heard, certainly I invite uh, the conversation to continue, but as I'm hearing the, uh, the talk slow down and I think the chat is well, that's it. <laughs> this, I mean, it, it, only, it only lets me give you a little bit at a time. So uh, yeah, let me, let me try and email you, Chris. Okay. I can I can put it all in an email that might be quicker to you. Okay. So yeah, I guess while Chris is, is uh updating and editing the document, we can we can move to the next item, which is to discuss hosting community listening sessions and healing circles. And that I'm not sure who's taking lead on that discussion, but. Well, Taylor, I'll share that we've held several as well as I think um, a couple of other organizations have done some work out there, but it's hard to do without the funding to do it. I can't keep going to private citizens and saying, reach in your pocket to do this. If there's uh -huh. It's the inventory overstock sell-off at Lazy Boy. This to fundraise for a Lazy Boy. <laughs> and I think that each of the have been very effective because they brought, you know, some kind of healing and some hope, especially having um Dia Beckton attended one, and then um, the public defenders, because people want answers, like who, who's looking out for us as we're suffering in, in this city and wondering. And so when they presented, they presented information that helped equip people to better understand 
But I go and I talk to people and some people are saying they're not doing anything because they weren't there. So I would like us to have a plan as was suggested earlier for us to have a robust healing um, effort for the city, the any specifically, but also Pittsburgh and anywhere else people. I use a definition of when I'm looking for where people play, work, live, work, play, or pray. And a lot of people come into Antioch to also pray and play. And so um, it's impacting the whole community. I can't imagine living in this county and hearing about it and not having a negative response to it, especially if you have a heart. Um. I'll just speak then. Um, if uh, I, I know just being a part of some Zoom conversations and just listening to all the stories that have happened since this has come up, one thing that I've identified is a lot of people feel very isolated with these issues until there's a major event that comes out, which also just has a vast impact on everybody's mental health and how safe you even feel in the community. So my suggestion is, is like, I think a healing listening session and healing circle is great, but my concern is I don't want it to be one of those things that's kind of a one-off, like making sure that we have like some sort of like community partnership and organizations there that are engaging with folks that are listening. Because one concern that I have heard time and time again, since this whole scandal was brought to light, is folks saying that we don't want this to be one of those moments that fizzle out like that has happened with George Floyd or Breonna Taylor or anybody else who was unarmed and killed by the police that, you know, both, there's like this spark and outrage and then people just act like things are back to normal. So making sure that folks who are dealing with this trauma, that there is that community partnership that's still engaging them and interacting with them and working with community members. So it's not, hey, we showed up for two hours for an event, back to my life, all the same. So making sure that that mechanism is in place whenever this gets uh plan and building on what community partners can we bring to the table that can do that follow-up when necessary. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you need some type of processing, ongoing processing resolution, right? Uh, for folks uh, um, you know, who may not be able to have some form of uh, you know, therapy is because a lot of this stuff uh, needs to be really looked at as traumatization <laughs> because it's, it's difficult to wrap your head around. Um, you know, somebody doesn't like me because of my skin, you know, you know, color of my skin, and you're not getting due process and all kinds of other things, civil rights violations based on that, right? And so you're supposed to walk around, you know, like uh, you, you, you regular or you know, just you and somebody's plotting against you. That's unfair, right, to mm -hmm. say the least. Um, but then you have to mentally be able to just overcome that some kind of way. You're supposed to just leapfrog over all the hurdles and just be solid as a rock and, you know, non-aware that this is even there. That's a lot to ask a person for no reason, right? Um, so I think that needs to be addressed is how can we get, I mean, we, my agency provides some mental health services uh, and, and therapy sessions and all that kind of stuff at no cost to any resident in this county from Martinez to Discovery Bay. But it's a small component. It's like one person providing these, uh, these services. So how can we look at it in a more broader aspect from our county agency or somewhere, or something, or something, go ahead. Oh, no. oh, I'm, 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 I'm going to you. So, um, um, for that, to me, and personally, I'm, I'm speaking personally, but also in a general uh, aspect for uh, something like that should be brought to the forefront, if possible, um, for just residents who uh, have been affected or haven't been, been affected regardless, you know, because it happened. 
And if you live in the city or you're a resident of the city or something like that, then you should have, that should be another avenue that's being provided or offered to the public, um, you know, because of what took place. It's just like, it's just really hard sometimes. I mean, I'm, I don't consider myself to be average when it comes to all that, because I expect a lot of that because I've been, you know, a part of it. Um, but I know it's people that's not like me that really don't know how to process that. And you have to have tools uh, because, you know, just, just try to do it on your own and through, uh, you know, I don't even, you know, know what to call it, but uh, winging it or whatever, uh, just don't always get it. So you don't always process it in a way where you can kind of like um, manage. I always use the word manage because it don't, dissip it don't dissipate or disappear, but you have to figure out how to mentally manage all of that type of trauma and manage it where you can stay functional, right? In your, you know, societal, you know, responsibility and all that kind of stuff. So um, I just think the public deserves that, that type of uh, reaching out, you know. So I was gonna follow up with and uh, follow up to the the um, work we've already done with listening sessions. Um, there's gonna be a virtual healing symposium to reach more individuals because I wanted to invite a subject matter expert guest, uh, Dr. Harold uh, Lewis, who does this type of trauma healing work from across you know the nation, having shown up for Brianna Taylor and others who were healed to start doing some of the healing necessary in the community. Um, and I have enough money for him to do it virtually. And every all of you will be invited on June 26th. I took a call now and uh, you agreed to that, to do that first part for free. But I literally hate asking people from outside of the community to do something for free. And then we came up with a date of July 15th for him to actually come in and I'm looking at the Nick Rodriguez Center as a space, and it will be open to all. And so, yeah, we uh, I don't want to say, as I've been doing, dipping into my own pocket when I know we're in a wealthy county and where Antioch is the second largest city in the county that has resources. I mean, it doesn't make sense for us to, you know, be having a private citizen do $500 for pizza and this person in the church I'm working with, Genesis, collecting a special you know, special donations to do something around healing. It just should be, just as we responded to COVID, we should have a response to this to stop the harm that will result in young people who do not trust law enforcement anymore that are now making poor decisions that will lead them to jail. So invest now or invest later. That's, that's totally how I feel about it. After we had uh, Alan come in with um, Brandon and do the sharing your rights, as was presented to us, it did bring up some issues for young people. So now we have a session every Wednesday night on looking at some of the um, work done around civil rights to improve, because you have to empower these young people to know you can make a difference. Don't just carry the pain. And all of that is being done. Uh, my NAMI budget does not necessarily authorize. For this particular, so I'm just like pulling funds and going to my board and saying, can we spend money on? It, it, it doesn't make sense. We're not a fully funded program. We get money from the county to recruit volunteers, but we're the place that people come to when there's pain in the community because they've identified our staff as people who have helped them in the past. But, you know, no one wants to be, you know, filling. Robin Peter to pay Paul when, when we have such a wealthy, we have a wealthy county. We should have some one-time only money. And I did put an email out and I asked our, our behavioral health department, don't you have mental health services one-time only money that you can put toward this effort since we were one of the counties on the list of having to revert money back to the state but not spending it fast enough? Because we're one of the counties that have the A3 program that's only half staffed. I mean, why would we not be proactive instead of 10 years from now caging some of these young people who did not get their answers answered and started internalizing their pain? We, we could do it differently.
And we've had other faith communities, we saw eugenicists step up, but it's kind of splintered and siloed. And we need, as you said, Melvin, to come together and to work with, you know, your organization. So, you know, <clears throat> my phone rings off the hook and I'm not hearing this by myself. <clears throat> what I'm hearing for the, potentially the community engagement and funding subcommittee, maybe some opportunities to kind of connect the work that Melvin and Gigi and um, Ronell and others are, are lifting up and to figure out what the hard job role is in that. And then if there are opportunities to make um, requests of the county to support any of that work where it would be aligned with the hard job and our um, kind of mandates and goals. And I, I think what, what might be helpful in that subcommittee, and I'm happy to attend to, is what are opportunities? There's so much community work happening. What are opportunities to support that and align with it and, and, and look at specifically um, lifting up some additional kind of healing circles and sessions with the, our jobs so that we can engage in the kind of listening campaign I think we need to to, to figure out how to move forward um, with our work this year. So um, Patrice, I know you all have been working on dates for those, so I don't know if there are any dates for those. Yeah, initially, um, I think I uh, indicated in my email to all the members that we were going to resume our uh, subcommittee meetings in June, and C was actually um, uh, set to go June 8th, which is in like two days, so we'll likely need to reschedule that uh, meeting. Um, mostly because we need to determine what the agenda items will be following this special meeting. So um, I know Chris is likely will get with you, Melvin, um, to, to identify another uh, potential date in June for the seat uh, meeting. But, um, uh, and we can certainly add that to the uh, list of agenda items to maybe identify or start to talk about developing a community healing plan, what events are available that are currently underway that our job could support. Um, if there is, a, as part of the update to the equity committee or PPC uh, uh, committee meeting uh, with regards to any sort of funding that we'd like to see for there, um, we can add those to the, to the agenda. Yeah. And I think um, one thing that comes to mind and I can elaborate more with Chris and everybody else later is like whenever we, and you, you already mentioned it, but just emphasizing like whenever we come up with a plan, just making sure that we have like some sort of like ask to our various bodies within the county to potentially fund different community engagement outreach things. So it's not incumbent on just the community-based organizations or private citizens like JG was saying to help fund it, but seeing like, hey, we want to table at these several events that are happening in the county to let people know about upcoming events, healing circles, or the racial justice oversight body in general. <laughs> what What is the cost of that? And can we leverage any county funding to actually support those efforts? Or do I have to bring my own table and just say, hey, I got my racial justice oversight body at I'm signed in and I'll let you know when the next meeting is. I can do that, but that's kind of irritating for me because I got a small car. And I think it's in direct alignment with what Steve have been working on in the past around developing this community capacity fund, mm -hmm. though it was initially structured uh, around how do we best support, provide technical assistance to those emerging organizations, but maybe there's a carve out for funding um, for you know, the healing centers or circles or what have you that in a lot of ways is sort of speaking to, to capacity to some degree. And I, I like Melvin's last point about also one of our, our goals that we haven't talked about a lot is bringing more folks in, having the community, you know, on Zoom and in the room at our meetings so we can also bring, integrate those voices into our work as we move forward. I think the suggestion that Next meeting, and I don't know if this has been done because I'm new, but have the next meeting in the community um, at a time where it's convenient for the community to be, because those don't necessarily have to be, I know we have public comment, but they don't have to be mutually exclusive, and we can certainly um, leverage every opportunity to listen. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if it has to be a meeting at six o'clock, then it should be. Um, I think just being responsive 
is is one way, at least for the next meeting. I like that idea. I wonder, Patrice, if we could. I, I do think having a meeting quarterly away is too far. That we're going to need to schedule something much sooner, as well as with the subcommittees. But I wonder if one option would be scheduling our next meeting in East County, close to where folks are impacted at hours when we think um, the community can make it to the meeting, and then having it be uh, both a meeting where we talk about our work and a community um, input or listening session. Sure, I can work on the logistics around all that, but I will challenge the members um, <laughs> to also be sure that you can be available um, yep. in person um, at an hour that might be off of what we're typically used to. And the only reason why I say that is because this is obviously su subject to Brown Act and we yeah. have to have quorum and maintain quorum for the entirety of the meeting. Otherwise, we will have to cancel the meeting. So. We can certainly work on that, and if I can, uh, as I reach out to all of you to get your commitments, we make sure we can maintain that and hold that for the entirety of uh, time of that meeting. The other piece I wanted to mention is that um, being that we have seats on the body that represent the racial justice coalition, so any any in any case that we are, our work is adjacent to some of the community groups to be able to move away from some of the restrictions under the Brown Act being able to support any events that they have where our job members can be in attendance of. Now, mind you, please don't all show up where it's quorum. <laughs> now got but all to say that way we can ensure that any sort of community me meetings where we really want it to be as free flowing as necessary, uh, we can look at that strategy as well. So a little bit of both actually. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that, except um, just keep in mind, the deeper you go into East County and you're talking about six o'clock, you're challenging those of us who have to come from far away in traffic. There you go. If we could identify a place that could provide a hybrid option, we'll certainly look into that. I do yeah. know that all of the uh, supervisors' offices have that hybrid option. Now, mind you, those are smaller locations. Yeah. We, we'll, we'll, we can look into it for sure. Yeah, I like the idea of doing it when the community can be there. Just just know that it's challenging for some of our community to get some place that's not accessible by transit and during commute hours. So we just need to be mindful of that. That's all. And I was going to say that I noticed that we're not getting through our agenda items this session. Like this is yes, a, and we're having issues getting through agenda items. And I know that we had that big issue with. Antioch and what's going on with law enforcement. Um, I don't know if we need to take a look at or reevaluate the whole quarterly meeting thing or whether we need to um, implement more committees and do more committee work. I know norm I know we normally get a lot of this, like doing this drafting kind of stuff. We usually kind of get that done in committees and we get more stuff done in committees. So I don't know if we need to reevaluate that because I, I believe we had a presenter that didn't even get to present I, I see another I'm assuming you were going to get a sheriff's no. report no no, no? okay no, I, no. I thought I think we're just present. discussing okay really. yeah. I thought it was going to be a, pre yeah, uh, a report yeah. but <laughs> Good question. It, it just seems like we have like this is a special session because last time we couldn't get through everything so we had to create a special session to get to this and now here, here we are after 12 o'clock and we still haven't even got to everything including you know number five which I think was a big point of when we're supposed to review kind of our our role and everything and are we going to you know what's our, our role in implementing things versus just discussing things versus actually implementing things but um i just want to say that i am encouraged by the work that um the police uh, the, the, the pe did before the center for pe did before like what they're doing in other places encourages me that we can do similar things here but I like, I love the discussion that we all get to talk about all this stuff, but I would like to see more transition implementing. I like to see getting more funding for some of these projects and some of these actual things, boots on the ground. I would love to see more of that happening um, because we could talk about this stuff at nauseum. We could talk about this forever. And it is a lot of deep felt feelings about this, but I, I would like to see us move towards getting actually more work and implementation done. That that's 
kind of reason why I'm here is to actually try to get some work done. So that's what I like to see us figuring out what we're going to do here as support as committee, subcommittee, and getting to agenda items. Um, one thing I was going to mention as uh, they the topic around like where we could have some of our next meetings more like in the effective sites could also be a conversation that we have at the uh, community funding and engagement subcommittee meeting because I do think it is worthwhile trying to identify different parts of the county like I would just like I don't mind driving from Richmond to Antioch and do it all the time for other things so I would like to have more of a focus meeting in Antioch where we can have that subcommittee and talk about it and plan like where could we have meetings in other parts of the county where people might want to engage but not necessarily have a forum to engage. I know there's a lot of logistical issues that we need to work out, including county staff, Brown Act. So I think it is a worthwhile agenda item just to have at that next subcommittee meeting and see what general draft action plans we can have and what it's going to take to implement those plans like hybrid meeting options make sure there's enough space get enough location so on and so forth yeah and i just want to say really quickly and i know we're up on time and folks got to get out of here yes, and, but before we move uh please don't leave before a vote takes place or at least hear how you guys want to move forward with public statements but i will say that at least i have reached out to a few departments to see if they would be willing to be a look, uh, a, a meeting location for um, some of the subcommittees. So I'm uh, waiting to hear back on whether or not that will take place. Um, but they've mostly been centralized in Martinez. So I will see if there's any other locations that are out further or other West County or East County for sure on that. And then just to make a quick suggestion, our uh, an update, our next, uh, well, we'll need to reschedule the community engagement and funding subcommittee was originally uh, tentatively scheduled for June 8th. We'll look at another date in um, June to have that. The diversion subcommittee is uh, slated to take place June 15th. And then our data subcommittee is slated to um, start on June 22nd. So with the remaining agenda items that are here, we can move those over to those subcommittee meetings. So I'm guessing like the share of oversight uh, for us, uh, the share quarterly report can maybe move to the data um, committee meeting, the community healings uh, circles and sessions and online planning can move to C. And we can, before we head out, see if folks are ready to go with the public statement today. So just yeah. that sounds great. Um, I do want to point out that Christina has her hand up, and then Cheryl. Um, and I know we're over time, so yeah. Thanks, Shayla. I just want to point out we do have public comment in the Q and A. I'm not sure if you can see it, but I just wanted to make sure it was seen before the meeting ends today. Can you see it right now, Shayla? If not, I can try to post it in. No, I don't see it. Yeah, I'm there. I'm Cheryl, you want to go? And then we'll go back to the public comment. Yes. Um, I, I think all of that is great. The plan is great for subcommittees, but my question is not a data subcommittee issue. I purposely wanted to talk about it at this meeting and because it's, a, it's an issue that has to be decided at the general body. It's about the Truth Act for it. So I apologize that we're over limit and all of that, but they 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 didn't there's they're not my blame. But we need to decide. It's something that I wanted to discuss before this body because it's 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 dealing with that. So we have one. No, we lost four. Yeah. Right. We can vote on this then. First actions out, Christopher. Yep. Step the actions, and you said racist. Blah 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 blah. Actions. Are Take you, the first one. Yeah, out. you are yeah. processing for her. Yeah. Okay. Well, then we have to start off. What was I missed most of that? <laughs> <laughs> it was a couple of different conversations. We have form. I think that's the most. Okay. Okay. Um, and Michael, you had an edit. 
yeah, at first it didn't make sense. It said the actions of racist. Ah, uh, I got you. Blah, blah, yeah, there's blah. a lot of lot of copy and paste. Yeah. Um, And just to clarify, you said we do have form right now. Yes, I didn't realize Alana is here as a serving as proxy for VA back then. So we're good to go. Yeah. So would it be helpful to go ahead and review the statement, take a vote on it, and then I mean, if time, if folks have a little time, maybe discuss Cheryl's question about the truth act form. I'm not sure how folks are all the time, so. But I, I think we should at least try to get this, this draft um, approved by the board so it can move forward. Of the, the other, of the all, that first one. Appreciate you. I don't think you need the word the after have directly impacted disparate outcomes. Um, maybe use the word also, Christopher. We also vehemently agree. All right. Um, just you can stop me anywhere. I just wanted to move down to the. Yeah, I wanted to see this one. This is what I wanted to see. And an end to state sanction police violence. Yep. And Patrice and I had talked about having the sign off be from all committee members rather than just chairs. Sure. All right. Um, I think it's a different word, not reform, not police reform. It's a different word. Right? Where where are you? First sentence of that paragraph above that paragraph you you have your cursor on. Yeah. Yeah. It was a different word. Yeah. I, I like it, it was policing something else. I like the word that they used or um, that the presenters used. Yeah, they did. They did say they, 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 uh, they public safety redesign. Yeah, public safety redesign. No, yeah, re redesign. That's the word. Redesign. Even if it was policing redesign, I don't care about that one. But it was the redesign word that was really good. Yeah. I just have one suggestion at the top. Yeah. Uh, First, I think it's the first or second paragraph. You refer to this body uh, assembled, but we don't reference. So when you say the racial justice oversight body, you have in parentheses RJOB. So I think when you reference it later on, instead of this body, the very last sentence, yep, just put the RJOB. RJOB. Yeah, I, that's a good one. Yeah, and I like the idea of everybody signing off. Voting members. That's what would my name on. Yeah, the voting members. 
Uh, meaning just type everybody's, yeah. everybody's name down here. Okay, I can do that for yeah. sure. Um, with a, you know, with a little help from the ORJ. <laughs> Doesn't have to be right now, but no. I think that's that's the. So, if there are are there any more substantive edits or revisions that we should discuss? Duly noted that we will add everyone's name to the to the bottom of this. I'll reemphasize. Uh, I don't know if it got captured, but I'll reemphasize. Um, what's your name again? You said voting members. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, both voting members are the our job is what Matt brought up too. Hmm. Yeah. Um, just, to there's Sorry. an S missing, Christopher, on the one, two, three, four, five. The second to the last sentence um, uh, line on the go down one paragraph. That paragraph go over incidents plural, right there. I think, do you need a comma after locally in that sentence? Towards structural change locally on the last sentence, paragraph above, paragraph above, locally, comma, which will ensure that such racism cannot continue. Or not cannot, does not. We we can't assure that it cannot, but does not. There you go. Or I don't even know if it's insure. Is it insure? um or mitigate maybe i don't know but which which will work towards or i don't know i think insure is fine i think i think because we said does not i think it it works no but it looks good center for policing equity to identify endorse and implement strategies Making our ability to reimagine public safety. Well, if we change and reimagine, making our ability to redesign public safety. And justice, a reality. Yeah. Issue justice are about relatively. Yeah, we have a question. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we need a motion if there's going to be a vote. So when folks have had a chance to review these, I can scroll up again. Um, you know, we will hear that motion whenever you guys are ready. I move it. I'll second it. So moved by Cheryl, second by Melvin. Patrice, can we get a roll call vote? Well, call for any discussion. You need. Oh, public. sorry. Open dis <laughs> discussion. Public comment. <laughs> any discussion? Any public comment at this time? All right. Turn it over to you, Patrice. Okay, Alicia Jackson. I agree. Well, now, Ellis. Yes. Michael Pearson? Yes. Shayla Bonner? Yes. Melvin Willis, you second, so I take it you're a yes? Yes. Shannon Orton? Same. Alana Matthews? Yes, with the understanding that the motion was we accept the amended public statement as a statement for the board. Just to clarify that, because we just said I so moved. Yeah. <laughs> so moved, and we didn't clarify what we're moving. So I'm a yes vote for that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Ellen McDonald? Yes. Issa E. McCarles? Yeah. Thank you. Keep us on our toes. Ursula Garibay? Yes. Ms. Earl? 
Email, email. Yes, and yes, with that clarification, yes, it is on the amended. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, but we have, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, this is one abstention. Motion carries. Thank you, Patrice. Thank you all for that. I'm um, sorry we, we've uh, gone over, and I'll just point out uh, to Michael's point uh, as far as the agendas, um, because we knew this was something that the whole body would need to sign off on. We wanted to uh, give everybody the space to come back. That's why we needed to have a special session. That session was scheduled for two hours, right? You guys are usually meeting for three. Had we met for three, I'm sure we probably could have gotten to everything on the agenda this time around as well. And as you see, you know, it took us about 220 or so to actually get uh, all of this done. So um, just just trying to shoehorn some time in to to do this in response to the moment because the moment is urgent. Um, and that's that's been the uh, the reason for the sort of going over and sort of the inability to hit all of our agenda items today. One last thing before we close out, um, we initially had the next order since this is a special meeting. Our next quarterly was set to be scheduled for June 27th, but I did get word that that's board meeting, so a lot of folks may not be able to attend that one. The following um, quarterly meeting is scheduled for September 26th, so if folks are wanting to meet a little bit sooner than that, we can certainly set up another full body meeting sometime in July, and I can reach out to all of you with that. Um, however, if not, and you wish that we just move forward with the dates as set, we can certainly do that and meet again in September. So just wanted to lift that up for you all to decide. <laughs> I think we have enough unresolved issues. We should meet in later in June or in July. Yeah. Okay. I will reach out to all of you to um, do a little doodle for July days. Chair Bonner is meeting adjourned. Yes, we are adjourned. <laughs> All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Likewise. Well, you know that.